trying to do everything that we can to educate people about what you can do on surface control for bacteria and viral control. A Portland company known for making equipment for breweries now takes on the coronavirus. Hello and welcome. I'm Galen Etlin. Thank you for being here. Portland Kettle Works created what it calls the germ fogger. John Goodwin shows us that machine and its disinfecting mist. In 2011, when Thad Fisco started Portland Kettle Works, it was a pivot from real estate development and construction to something more refreshing. We essentially went from making earthquake retrofit uh, retrofits for buildings into uh, brewing equipment. The company helps craft breweries go from startup to success. For Thad, the progression of his own business is something even he never expected. We had a pretty strong background in sanitation because working in the in the beverage industry, every every tank we build has sanitation facilities in them. And Germ Fogger was born. Fisco's new company that bubbled up fast to aid in the fight against the coronavirus. Eight weeks from whiteboard with a a marketing and sales team to having a spun up website and selling our first units. To our knowledge, the only machine like this made in the United States. This mobile unit meets CDC standards for infectious disease control. It holds a five gallon tank filled with a disinfecting agent. Thad says with a pair of applicators, it can fog 15 to 18,000 square feet in about an hour. It runs off of two application wands that you can that you attach with hoses and they can go 100, about 150 feet each direction. So you have 300 feet of continuous capabilities with the machine, which is great. Schools, airports, and hospitals are some of the early customers aiming to wipe out the virus from high touch surfaces. It gives a certain level of comfort to people. They can get out in public and know that, hey, you know, I'm in an environment that's safe. Uh, when people are using machines like this to, to control the disease. Assembled here in Portland, this small machine could play a big part in keeping us safe. So we need to be prepared to fight it in a different way, and that's how we become involved in doing what we're doing. Thad tells us the company has sold machines to schools and convention centers and even the Detroit airport. He says they're trying to build at least 200 machines each month. And I've got some good news here for families, too. The Oregon Zoo will reopen this week after being shut down since March. It'll open to everyone this Sunday, but zoo members can return a few days earlier on Thursday. I actually grew up going to the Oregon Zoo because my dad worked there, so I've got a lot of great memories. Now, if you do go now, keep in mind you'll be required to wear a mask. There will also be timed ticketing that you must reserve ahead of time online. I spoke with Zoo Director Don Moore about the good work staff are doing to care for animals during this pandemic. Our staff is incredibly passionate, um, even though we've been closed. The animal care staff, the facility staff has been coming in every day and providing great care for the animals, as you can see on our Facebook page and our Twitter and M feeds. Um, the animals are doing great, but they, they miss people, I think. The zoo's social media page is full of good video and good stuff. Now visitors will also have to follow one-way outdoor paths. Keep that in mind. There's a young starling in Sandy who is the talk of the town. Our photojournalist Stephen Redlin introduces us to the bird they call Mouth. Have you seen my bird? I haven't seen him today. Like I said, not even five minutes ago. I didn't know if that's what you guys were doing, otherwise I would have brought him over. We're looking for him. They're looking for Mouth, a young starling raised by a human mother. My name is Trisha Hawkins and I raised Mouth. I don't know, I always say he, but could be a boy or a girl. Mama Trisha got the call from her cousin one day. Um, she was coming back from the barn one morning and just happened to see this little thing laying on the ground and she thought it was dead at first till she picked it up and realized it was still alive. You might be able to guess why he's called Mouth. All baby starlings have a yellow beak when they're first born. It doesn't take long for them to grow out of it, but the name won't ever go away. Don't worry, that silly looking beak is fully capable of taking in the food. I learned that cat food soaked in water is one of the best like high protein things that you can feed a baby bird. I showed up a little early to the Sandy Fred Meyer store and thought, I'll grab some food as bait. And yes, I was anxious to make a good impression. So we'll see what Mouth thinks about this. Everybody loves him. I think I love him the most. The whole family adopted Mouth and he made himself at home. What are you doing, Mouth? So I tried to sneak my phone around the corner and catch him talking to himself in the mirror. It was 
pretty comical. He flew off my shoulder and up onto the corner of the house. Mouth's first solo flight outside impressed his mom. Oh, definitely, definitely proud. But one morning he didn't come back. As any good surrogate mother will do, Trisha was worried. So with good advice, she created the Facebook page, The Adventures of Mouth. Has anyone seen her adopted starling? Do they know that Mouth is a human-loving bird? The page took off. 775 likes and 813 friends so far. I just wanted to check on him and make sure he was all right. I don't know. I was definitely anxious to find Mouth. I don't think I'm gonna. The bird I was just spotting, it went to the fuel station. Mouth! 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 And then we got the call from a friend asking... If that was Mouth next to his foot. And I was like, yes, where are you? Where else would you find a human tame starling than at the outside standalone recycling center in the middle of the parking lot with people everywhere? Hi, buddy. Oh, come here. You have some mealworms? Hi, I brought you a treat. <laughs> oh, yeah, you like that. Oh, look at your feathers. You're getting so big. Oh, he's got the spots on his chest now, and he's getting more of his adult feathers. Hi. You're making friends everywhere, aren't you? Oh, maybe. Put your hand up under him like this, and he'll step up on your hand. Ooh. Or he'll fly away. <laughs> and my seeds, well, they were not mealworms. There you go. What have you been up to? Yeah. Oh, there we go, right on the head. No, nope, there's nothing in there for you. Trisha misses Mouth and wants the wayward starling to come home. Come on, let's go home. But minutes later, Mouth has a new human friend. Not afraid at all. He's just giving himself a bath. <laughs> what an amazing video. I also love watching our photographer, Steve, walk around the parking lot going, Mouth, Mouth. <laughs> Maybe it'll work for you. Let us know if you see it. All right, well, next here, a unique Portland protest with paint. Artists auction off their work to help support the local black community. This is just here to put stuff on people's mind and put things in people's hearts to push toward the real change. Well, the Portland Black Lives Matter demonstration is centered around good art. Dozens came out to the PDX Paint to Protest at Cathedral Park over the weekend, and photojournalist Mike Gallimanis takes us there. Hey, yeah, yo, I stay down like a bunker. This is just something that we can do because we're artists. This is cool, like, it's gonna take a lot more than what we're doing right here. Some artwork is finished already and being auctioned off. The other artwork that's being completed on the spot is there to sort of increase the optics and give something entertaining for people to watch and uh, really sense that meaning of what the paintings are all about. It's really inspiring to see how this connects with so many people. I think there's something visceral about art and music uh, speaking those truths. All the proceeds are going to four organizations which support the Black Lives Matter community. Like the real change does definitely doesn't come from this. This is just here to put stuff on people's mind and put things in people's hearts to push toward the real change. The real change is in the schools, the real change is in the offices, the real change is in our hearts. And I think that this activates people in a different way, maybe equally important, but uh, all lanes must be filled and uh, we're doing what we can in our own style. This is how we choose to protest. I think the city is like, it's a real anomaly in the country, man. Like there's so much space for so many different mindsets and perspectives and walks of life and so many different places for things to intersect and co just, just to merge together. And it really happens in real ways out here. And I just, it's beautiful, so I love it. We are hoping to do this every first Sunday and uh, as we're seeing already in one month's time, it's grown so much. So we're really excited about the power that this has. And Cathedral Park under the St. John's Bridge is a beautiful place to showcase art like that. Now, meanwhile, proceeds from the paintings and donations collected are given to organizations that help the local black community and organizers hope to continue this event each month. So hopefully you can check it out. Now, if you have a positive story to share with us, you can send photos or videos with the KGW app. Just scroll down to the good stuff section and click submit here. Fill out the form, upload a photo or video, tag the location, then watch for it on KGW. And there's much more good stuff ahead. The Hillsboro Rotary Club honored local health care workers with a 4th of July parade. They'll talk about how it came together after the break.
Welcome back to the good stuff. We are coming off the 4th of July weekend and on Facebook I asked about how you celebrated the holiday this year. And it was a great weekend to get outside. Jackie Wilde enjoyed this Mary and Barry margarita on her deck. Girl, I was with you in spirit on my rooftop. Thank you for sending that in. Lynn White also spent time outside. He shared this picture of a neat plant taken from a neighbor's garden. And Debbie Tompkins used her time to do some good, cleaning up trash on the Oregon coast with her husband. Thank you so much for doing that and for sending that in. And for those of you watching at home, let us know how you spent the holiday weekend. You can text your photos to 503-226-5088. Well, check this out. The Hillsborough Rotary Club canceled its annual 4th of July parade because of the pandemic, but members decided to put on a parade to honor local health care workers instead. On Saturday, they decked out their cars in red, white, and blue and drove by Tuality Healthcare and some other rehabilitation centers. Hillsborough Mayor Steve Calloway and Hillsborough Hops mascot Barley even joined in. And we want to thank Donna Bozak for sharing the video and photos with us. <laughs> Well, Portland's iconic Waterfront Blues Festival did not go on in person this year, but some people got to see a live concert from their homes. The Blues Festival bandwagon brought its music to driveways and front porches across the city. Musicians performed for nominated nurses, teachers, senior care workers, and Blues Festival superfans. So it was a win-win situation. It was really amazing to be able to make the phone calls to invite band members to a paid gig because most musicians have been out of work for the last three, four months. That is a win-win. A quick reminder here, if you bought a ticket for the Waterfront Blues Festival this year, you will be able to use it for next year's event. And with many live performances and concerts on hold, the local art scene is taking so many hits during the pandemic. But an expert tells us he's optimistic about the future. Brenda Braxton shares his take. The arts are the heart and soul of a community. Music, plays, galleries. Artists are creators. They can't help themselves. Um, they, they look at the same thing that everybody's looking at and they see something different. They take a world that is, is in, in many times, especially the times that we're in right now, very stark and very bleak um, and give us a reason for hope. Um, and, and joy for the future. But with COVID closing the curtain on large gatherings, artists are hurting. Andrew Racinos is a musician turned tech expert. His company works with arts groups, and he took to Facebook to explain what they're up against. Anywhere from 40 to 60 to 70 percent of the arts industry right now is unemployed or laid off or furloughed. Um, and that's not probably going to change for many months. He's the president of Tessitura Network. The not-for-profit helps 700 arts organizations in 10 countries run their businesses. And depending on the organization, about half of their income may come up from ticket sales and the other half from private donations from individuals or corporations, foundations. Racino says many people don't realize what the arts do for the economy. Arts contribute. $877 billion to the national economy. Okay, so this is arts, culture, and entertainment. It's 4.5% of the economy comes from the arts. That's bigger than travel. It's bigger than agriculture. Ironically, artists are finding bigger audiences right now. They're not doing it in person, though. They're doing it online. But digital has its downside. It also is making almost no money. So, you know, that's the other side of it. So I'll hear from people, well, it's fine, they can still do their thing online. But you can't charge 50, 60, $100 a ticket for Facebook Live. So will the arts in Portland bounce back after COVID? Racinos is optimistic. From the symphony and ballet to the smaller acts that keep Portland weird. He says the Rose City has an amazing cultural ecosystem. People come to Portland to a certain extent because of the vibe, right? And think about what the vibe is of Portland and how much of that comes out of the inherent cultural um, diversity that we have in this city around the art that we produce. If, if we all do a little bit to take care of them, they will be here to help comfort and guide us through this time and be there for us on the other side. These folks aren't out there singing their hearts out or, or dancing their hearts out for free. You know, this is a profession. These are so many of them are professionally trained. They've gone to school for this. They've done their 10,000 hours to be able to share their passion with the world. 
We've got a vibe, right? Brenda also talked to Andrew about things that we can do right now to help support local arts and culture. And we'll highlight more of those ideas here on The Good Stuff tomorrow. And still ahead, good views of Oregon's coast. We'll share a little dose of beauty from Cape Perpetua. Good to have you back here with us. Now these days, many of us are limiting travel, right? But that does not mean we can't enjoy the beauty of the Pacific Northwest from our homes. So our Grant McComey has a beautiful coastal spot to share. Getaway photographer Jeff Kastner has a terrific idea this week. We go somewhere in Oregon to the Central Oregon coastline, Cape Perpetua National Scenic Area, where you'll find sea lion caves, a lighthouse, and a spectacular site called Thor's Well. The video Jeff Kastner puts together is always so spectacular. You can learn more about Cape Perpetua on the Grants Getaways page of KGW.com. And we want to thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Remember to keep sharing that good stuff. You can text us your photos and stories to 503-226-5088 anytime. Now to close the show out, we want to show you another beautiful view. This one from our Skycam in the Dalles. The sun is out. It is glorious. Thank you again for watching. Have a great night. Providence Center.